Μαζί μας, στα πλαίσια των διακεκριμένων διαλέξεων που κάνει το ΚΕΠΕ αρκετά α, συχνά τελευταία, έναν α, πολύ σημαντικό καθηγητή διεθνούς φήμης, χρήματα οικονομικής και managing editor του επιστημονικού περιοδικού European Financial Management, τον κύριο Γιάννη Δούκα. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Κύριε Δούκα, θα μου πάρει μερικά λεφτά γιατί έχει μεγάλο βιογραφικό ο κύριος Δούκα. Θα το πω όλο. Ε, με τίτλο το Investor Sentiment, Beta and the Cost of Equity Capital. Ένα πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον θέμα, γιατί συνδυάζει και την κλασική χρηματοοικονομική και το κομμάτι του Behavior Finance, το οποίο έχει πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον την τελευταία περίοδο. Ε, ο κύριο Δούκα είναι καθηγητή χρηματοοικονομική στο Old Dominion University τη Virginia και όπω ήδη έχω πει, ιδρυτή του, του European Financial Management Association και managing editor του διεθνού κύρου επιστημονικού περιοδικού European Financial Management. Είναι ερευνητικό συνεργάτη τη χρηματοοικονομική στο Cambridge uh, Joint Business School, το Πανεπιστήμιο του Cambridge. Έχει ένα πλούσιο uh, βιογραφικό. Το διδακτορικό του έχει κάνει στο Stern School of Business του Πανεπιστήμιου τη Νέα Υόρκη. Ε, έχει διατελέσει επισκέπτη καθηγητή οικονομικών στο Stern uh, την περίοδο 2001-2003. Έχει διδάξει μεταπτυχιακά προγράμματα, διδακτορικά. Αυτό που είναι πραγματικά εντυπωσιακό είναι το, το, τα, τα, τα journals, τα οποία έχει δημοσιεύσει τα καλύτερα περιοδικά στο χώρο μας, όπως το Journal of Finance, στο GFQA, στο Journal of Corporate Finance, στο Journal of Portfolio Management, στο Journal of Bagger Finance. Σε όλα τα περιοδικά, τα γνωστά του χώρου μας, ο κ. Λούκας έχει δημοσιεύσει. Εμείς γνωριστήκαμε πριν 15 χρόνια περίπου στην Ελβετία, και είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά που μετά από 15 χρόνια ε, α, ε, είμαι εδώ και τον α, καλό ως πρόεδρο του ΚΕΠΕ να μας μια εξαιρετική, το θέμα πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον και να μας πει μια σειρά από εμπειρίες που έχει που ήμασταν πάρα πολύ χρήσιμη για μας. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ για την πλούσια ενδιαφέρον, η οποία ήταν καλύτερη υπόλοιπη πέντες. Πραγματικό εντελώς, ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ Πιο μεγάλη ευχαρίστηση γιατί είδα παλιού συναδέλφου και συμφιλητέ, ο οποίο συγκεκριμένα ένα συμφιλητή με τον οποίο είμαστε σχεδόν 12 ώρε την ημέρα μαζί και στην Αθήνα και στο εξωτερικό. Αυτό είναι ο τάξη τη Αθήνα. Και μάλιστα είμαστε και φίλοι τη ίδια ομάδα. Επίση, έξω από τα καλύτερα. Δεν θα δώσω το όνομα τη ομάδα, διότι θέλω να δημιουργήσω αντιπάθεια. Αλλά είναι η ομάδα η οποία κερδίσει μόνο με στην Ελλάδα. Γνωστή παράγκα. Πάλι ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και θα μου δεχτεί η ευκαιρία σήμερα να μιλήσουμε για ένα πολύ σημαντικό θέμα, το οποίο νομίζω ότι είμαστε πολύ καλά γνώσες, αλλά θα δείτε μια διαφορετική γειτονία της δικής μας ανάπτυξης και πιο συγκεκριμένα η οπτική γωνιά του behavior of animals, βασικά. Η παρουσίαση μου, δυστυχώς, είναι φτιαγμένη μόνο στα εγκρίστρια και θα μου τρέξετε μόνο να την παρουσίαση στα εγκρίστρια, αλλά κατά άλλα τα διαστήματα θα μπορώ να μιλάω κοινικά. Έχω μεγάλη χέρια στα εγκρίστρια και δεν υπάρχει κανένα από αυτό. Εάν έχετε σχόλια ή κάποια ερώτηση ή κάτι άλλο, συμπαθήστε μου. Πολύ ευχαριστώ. Σταματήστε με και εγώ θα το συμπαθήσω. Δεν ξέρω πόση ώρα έχουμε, έχουμε, αλλά. Δεν υπάρχει φθήνο ώρα και χρησιμοποιείται στην ελληνική ζωή. Και τα PowerPoint slides είναι διαθέσιμα και το paper είναι διαθέσιμο. Είναι εδώ πέρα στο κομπίδιο, οπότε θα το πάρει. Και από εδώ, αλλά και αν σου δεν είναι κάτι. Μήπω να κάνω τα για να υπάρχει ένα καλύτερο κόντρα. Θα ήθελα να κάνω ένα σχόλιο. 
once again, this is uh, you know uh, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to be here, and I really thank you all for coming. I know someone came from uh, Yanina, so uh, I really appreciate that. This is uh, sort of a joint work uh, <coughs> with uh, Constantine uh, uh, New, uh, who's at Warwick uh, Business School now. He used to be at uh, Exeter before. And uh, uh, Subramanian, uh, Subra Subramanian from UCLA. And uh, this is a sort of a, a continuation of, uh, of our previous uh, you know, uh, work uh, with uh, the main um, uh, theme uh, being um, uh, sentiment. And uh, the difference in this paper from our previous paper is that um, we try to uh, use sentiment to explain sort of a, a standard anomaly, the so-called capital asset pricing anomaly that you're familiar with. And in our previous paper, um, we uh, try to address another anomaly, uh, the so-called momentum uh, gains anomaly that um, many uh, researchers have failed to sort of, you know, provide a, a sort of a reasonable kind of explanation as to why, you know, momentum trading uh, is a profitable uh, uh, strategy. Uh, exposed, um, you all know that momentum strategy, it's not a sort of a profitable strategy, right, after the collapse of uh, the uh, asset pricing in 2000, 2001, and more recently, uh, uh, the real estate uh, uh, you know, asset uh, collapse. And I'm saying this because a lot of you know hedge fund managers are, 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 are using uh, momentum strategies uh, have lost uh, significant amounts of money, uh, and one of them is AQR. And AQR is trying to survive by developing different tools and different strategies. And so our story in that that piece of work was that um, the gains of momentum. Uh, that have not been able to be explained by Fama French uh, are essentially you know, associated with gains realized during periods of high sentiment. And how do we measure sentiment, that is investor sentiment, um, it's, it's, a, it's essentially uh, using two standard you know, indices in uh, the finance literature. One is the bigger Wobbler, which we use here, and the other one, as a sort of a Westerns check, is the uh, uh, Michigan uh, Consumer Confidence Index, which is basically you know, uh, an index of confidence coming out of the broader uh, microeconomy. It's not that just an index that um, Baker Wobler will have created that relates to the sentiment in the capital markets or uh, sticking with the market. And our results are essentially the same. So uh, momentum gains are associated with high sentiment periods, right? We divide in our sample into you know high sentiment and low sentiment periods, uh, and high sentiment uh, you know is is basically positively associated with the gains. But this shows essentially that if you hold a portfolio right over a period of pessimism and optimism, right? At the end of the day, what you're going to have is Gains that are basically insignificant, right? Economically insignificant, not just you know an alpha that is statistically insignificant. And this is uh, related. This is exactly what we what, what we have seen in the market that a lot of these uh, you know uh, trading strategies have essentially you know uh, vanished uh, because of that. so the gains that these guys realized uh, were gains over a period of time where they attracted a lot of capital, huge inflows of capital, chasing assets, raising price, drifting prices away from um, uh, fundamentals, leading to misprice. So having done this work and uh, you know, uh, published uh, that work, um, we uh, uh, proceeded to sort of you know, address a more standard capital asset pricing you know, uh, anomaly and this relates to uh, the, uh, uh, the capital asset pricing model uh, per se, all right? Um, 
And, and what is the problem of uh, this kind of asset pricing, uh, you know, uh, that, that we're trying to address here? Well, you're familiar with the, uh, you know, single factor model, right? Um, <coughs> There was a classic study in 1992 by Pharma French where they showed that capital asset pricing uh, model is invalidated, right? In other words, the security market line was flat. The relationship between, uh, uh, between returns, expected returns, and the market risk data, right, uh, was flat. This is not uh, theoretically, right? Uh, this was not supposed to uh, happen. And this is what we pitched, right? Investments to our students. We told them that there is a positive relationship between risk, beta, systematic risk, market-based risk, and expected returns. So there's no free lunch, basically. That's the neoclassical story. What is behind the neoclassical story, right, or the CAPM, is that investors <coughs> hold homothetic expectations about the future, which is basically, you know, an embarrassment uh, to make that kind of assumption, right? This is a convenient assumption, right? But if you assume that traders hold homothetic expectations about future returns or future outcomes, the natural question is, why do we trade? How these guys get to end trading with one another when they hold the same kind of expectations, when they have the same beliefs? So basically, this is one of the violations, right, of the capital asset pricing. It takes two, right? Disagree to have a horse race, right? Or a betting. Therefore, there is disagreement in the marketplace. And the disagreement is between the optimist and the pessimist. Sometimes the, opti the optimistic investors dominate the market, as it has happened during the recent, you know, uh, pre crisis bubble with, res with respect to, uh, you know, uh, real estate assets, or before with, you know, uh, the tech stocks uh, way back in, you know, 2000, 2001, all right? Uh, of course, liquidity, right? Availability of excess capital in the marketplace plays a significant role in terms of boosting uh, excessive, uh, you know, optimism. In both, during both periods, right, we had we have this kind of, you know, uh, effect. Uh, as far as Greece is concerned, right, uh, if you want to relate what I'm saying to Greece's experience, right, is that Greece joins a new the currency, right, in 2001, and essentially, you know, there's a global optimism, all right, including a local optimism that Greece is going to sort of, you know, prosper, having access to huge capital flows, and as a result of that, we're going to experience what? Lower rates of return, right? Lower cost of capital, cost of capital for corporations went down from 35% to 5%, and real estate and consumer loans the same way. So you end up basically buying. And when you buy, basically you raise values. You raise real estate, right? You raise asset prices and so on and so forth. So there is optimism, right? This kind of optimism, it's not just a weak phenomenon, it's a local phenomenon. We experience that in the States first and then all over the place. So uh, to say that, you know, investors in the marketplace are operating efficiently in the sense that they are sort of, you know, rationally assess, uh, you know, uh, values, and in essence, this means that they assess, you know, value based on, you know, intrinsic values. Uh, that's basically a bit, uh, you know, overstops. Uh, we don't buy into this, right? And um, behavioral finance theories uh, tend to be uh, more, uh, uh, you know, uh, strongly uh, subscribing to this notion than, uh, you know, uh, others. And uh, I would say that uh, neoclassical theorists I have to sort of, you know, changed uh, Hume, and um, they're all basically nowadays uh, working uh, more or less uh, along the same lines. There's no uh, sort of clear division between uh, the two. So, uh, Pharma Fetch 1992, as I said, comes up with a very a sort of uh, major study showing that, you know, the CAPM is violated, all right? Uh, prior to the uh, Pharma-French war, uh, there have been a couple of other anomalies, right? The size anomaly and the book to market anomaly. So Pharma-French take these anomalies and create, you know, the 
SML and uh, SMB node factors and they throw them in. And the current class and pricing starts performing a bit better in terms of hardware, right? So the left hand, right hand side variables explain a larger portion of the viability of the left hand side variable, which is the rate of return. But some of them are unable essentially to uh, explain, right, uh, momentum. Why momentum? you know, uh, takes place basically and uh, these new factors, so to speak, cannot sort of, uh, you know, uh, mitigate uh, the, uh, the performance of the kind of surprising one. So, uh, and that, that's where, uh, you know, the, uh, the debate is. And then uh, there are other, uh, you know, other uh, researchers uh, in, in finance literature that have uncovered other, you know, limitations of the kind of surprising one. If you remember, you know, all it's, it's famous paper, he said essentially that the market index is basically a, a sort of a, an inefficient proxy of the market, right? Um, well, the market index captures basically what is traded, but uh, a lot of uh, assets, right, like human capital, it's not directly, you know, traded in the market. So therefore, the proxy that we have, the, 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 the Athenian, the Athens stock exchange index, right, it doesn't capture the, uh, the, 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 the market indexed in, in the local economy, right? It leaves out other things. It's a proxy, and it's a poor proxy, and that's the explanation. Others mentioned, you know, uh, uh, liquidity, and others said that, you know, there are no factors in finance uh, that we need to sort of explain uh, the behavior of uh, asset pricing, uh, but from characteristics. And uh, there is a sort of a, a, whole, a whole debate, uh, right, uh, uh, still on, on that issue. But before I get into, you know, into the details of my presentation, I just wanted to, to sort of, you know, focus on, you know, uh, the key motivation of the paper here, basically. Uh, this, this study is motivated, essentially, by, uh, uh, by, by the, uh, the fact that, you know, high beta stocks or assets are very risky, right? And uh, they are viewed as a vehicle by investors, especially you know, when they are optimistic, to come up with what? Abnormal returns, great alphas. Okay. This does not happen in pessimistic times because in pessimistic times, individuals are less a bit about you know, uh, the performance of these stocks. And uh, therefore, stocks um, are more likely to be traded close to sort of fundamental value. So mispricing during pessimistic times is it's less pronounced than it is during optimistic times. That's our, our issue uh, in this paper, basically, or our uh, non-obvious question. Uh, and since I see I have, you know, uh, we have here a lot of uh, young faces and students, right? Uh, this is a trick, basically, to write a paper, right? Never try to address or write a paper by addressing a sort of an obvious question. Uh, you should address a non-obvious question. This is, an, uh, this is a good example. I, I tend to believe, right? Uh, I think we are close to publication with this one, but uh, when it gets published, then I'm going to be 100% that I'm right, all right? So uh, that's, uh, th that's our issue here. And um, the other, uh, I just want to point out another limitation of the neoclassical finance theory, and that is that um, the neoclassical finance, so arbitrage, Limits are non existent, right? Arbitrage capital is available already uh, in abundance. Therefore, that leads to the belief that, you know, if there is mispricing, arbitrageurs are going to walk in, take out the mispricing, profit, and then restore values back to fundamentals. But arbitrage, right, is a risky business. If it wasn't a risky business, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't have experience, you know, what we experienced in Greece, Portugal, Spain, or even in the US. All right? Arbitrage is limited. And arbitrageurs basically are holding, are not holding, you know, that is why portfolio. That's another, you know, misleading assumption of the capital asset pricing model, right? Everybody is holding what? The market portfolio. Everybody is diversified, right? It's diversifying and systematically, right? So the, the residual risk is, 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 is that little, all right? In reality, 
Arbitrage measures are wholly, you know, very uh, small portfolios, non diversified portfolios. They specialize with a few assets, all right, and bet that these assets will perform based on their expectations. Okay. Therefore, they cannot take all the mispricing, or they cannot correct the mispricing in the marketplace. Okay. You would like to, you know, take away all the mispricing that exists, let's say, here in the real estate market, but there's only enough capital. The guys that they want to invest specialize on, you know, pockets of the market, and therefore they're interested for these pockets. All right? So uh, that's the other, uh, another, by the way, uh, major limitation of uh, the capital asset pricing theory, or in general, the new classical, you know, uh, finance uh, theory. So um, another limitation is that, you know, shorting, right, is, 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 is limited to, for the same reason. And liquidity, right, or financial constraints are also, you know, tight. Uh, more tight during optimistic times because money is, you know, running, chasing, you know, assets, and therefore, if you're going to borrow money, you know, you're not going to be able to find it, right? As much as you want, basically, to close quotes in the marketplace. So um, that's in brief, basically, our uh, you know, uh, idea behind this paper. And with this, um, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot blow this up. Uh, because when I do that, I pre-test it. Uh, the computer is pretty slow, and um, I cannot change page it, you know, slides with the frequency that I want. But I hope this is visible, right? Is, is this visible? Yes. Okay. Well, as I said before, you know, the CAPM of uh, sharp linear motion, right? Um, uh, I have sort of, you know, um, produced a sort of a positive relationship between, you know, beta and returns in uh, the so-called security market line, right? It is supposed to be, you know, positive uh, sloping, right? Um, this is not getting merit, right? It does not get support in, in, in the data. And the classical paper of Fama French in 92 uh, is, 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 is a proof, you know, to that. Then as I said before, there are various explanations, you know, uh, very, various authors have put different explanations uh, for this kind of uh, you know, anomaly or, or uh, breakdown of, uh, of uh, you know, um, the capital asset pricing model, that uh, we tend to believe that, uh, and others too, that uh, this issue has not been settled. And, and that motivates our uh, you know, uh, direction of, of our work. Right? So um, here is a list of you know, different theories coming from uh, the neoclassical, you know, uh, uh, finance uh, literature, right? Um, but um, we tend to believe that, you know, uh, the, the markets are, you know, uh, dictated uh, by in individual investor sentiment, all right? And uh, that sentiment has something to do with the uh, violation of the capital asset pricing model. Uh, more specifically, uh, unlike uh, the other, you know, uh, neoclassical uh, <coughs> behavioral stories, right? Uh, our story is, is, is focused on, you know, uh, investor mood and, and effect. Uh, and uh, we borrow this idea from the fact that, you know, there's plenty of evidence in other subjects of, 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 of science, uh, and especially, you know, psychology, right? And uh, Kahneman is uh, sort of like, Nobel Prize winner, basically, uh, evidence of you know, uh, the role of sentiment in the marketplace that uh, we want to take it and, and sort of, you know, play with and, and see uh, how that, uh, you know, relates to uh, or can restore uh, the capital asset pricing model. So that's our uh, focus here, right? Uh, in this paper, as I said, yeah, we examine essentially, you know, uh, whether sentiment affects Okay, um, the validity of the capital asset price model. And as I said before, we use two sentiment indices that are out there. Uh, there's one uh, that has been widely used uh, by Baker Wobbler, and uh, I might add here that Baker Wobbler um, have used that index to show that uh, managers cater to the, cater to investors uh, 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 in a way so that they can decide whether they should pay dividends or not pay dividends. You're probably familiar with the, you know, the catering story of dividends, right? 
And uh, that, that kind of work is considered, you know, classic. Um, and, uh, and I think that that measure, it's, 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 a, it's a good measure. And uh, it's not just that we use this measure alone, right? It's basically a measure that we take it a bit further by ortho orthogonalizing uh, the, the measure, make it much more exogenous than, 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 than uh, it's been used before. And we do the same kind of uh, you know, analysis, we conduct the same kind of analysis with this, the Michigan you know, uh, 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 Consumer uh, Confidence Index too. And invariably, we find more or less the same results. Our main result you know, uh, is, is there. So um, to give you a sneak preview, right? Uh, look at the left, uh, you know, uh, 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 diagram here. All right, we have uh, replicated our uh, our analysis here. This is the security market wide, right? Uh, beta, right? At the bottom is the risk uh, metric, right? And expected price on the vertical axis. Look at this, right? At this location, essentially, you know, the slope of this location is. Is flat. This is a violation of the capital asset price model. Capital asset price model is not, you know, is not, is not, is not expect, is not behavior the way it's expected. Now let me say why this is a very important issue, right? Remember that we use, you know, the capital asset price in order to estimate what the equity return, right? What do we do with the equity return? We use it to discount what the cash flows of the company, the cash flows of the stock, right? The cash flows of real estate, right? Asset. To figure out what it's, it's value. Now, when this this relationship doesn't work right, what does it tell you? That the discount factor basically is what the wrong one, not the appropriate. And as a matter of fact, you can figure out what's going to happen in pessimistic times or optimistic times. Now, if you don't care about splitting the sample, right, and you use a huge data set, which is basically what my or, or you know, your classical professor used to say, use a long data series. Use a long, a, 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 a sort of a long data series basically nullifies what? Offsets basically what? Sentiment, right? It makes everything the same. But you know, the markets are driven by points. History changes by points. It, it doesn't change by a lot of observations. There you have, you know, the other sort of economies, right? Rises abroad and liberates a country. Just an exaggeration, right? As an example. Now, if you use a lot of data points, right, you're gonna come up with a discount factor and you're gonna use that invariably, and everybody's using this, right? On that. This is the first thing we teach our undergraduates in investment courses, our MBAs, even our PhDs, right? Some of us, right, act as teachers, right? Uh, theologians, and, and uh, they're very adamant about this relationship. And in science, you cannot be adamant about anything. Tapadari, right? Until you prove, you know, reality, which reality again changes. So uh, when we focus on, you know, uh, pessimistic times, where we believe that sentiment is basically very little, right? And people are more rational, right? Right? What do you find? Look at the relationship, right? It's an actual solving, you know, uh, yeah. The relationship is positive. This is consistent with the capital asset pricing theory, right? This is US data. Yes. For the entire market standard course for your stock exchange. You can do that. We are, we are doing this. Right? But uh, this work has not been sort of you know, replicated on a global scale. Alright? And that's uh, the next thing to, to do basically. Uh, and the other thing is uh, also, you know, um, how culture plays into this. Some cultures are less optimistic than others, right? Some cultures are more optimistic, more bullish, right? More gambling. To, and I, I'm not so sure that they say that the Chinese are more, you know, uh, gambling uh, in nature. They put a lot of bets. You know, this is. You know, this is a, a you know sort of a lottery you know kind of value that some cultures have it, others don't. 
there are several papers now in, in finance literature and other, other uh, you know, studies too, and uh, other literature, where they show that uh, the role of culture is, is, is very important. As a matter of fact, uh, this uh, coming fall, there is uh, the first symposium that's going to be held in uh, South Carolina, the University of uh, Moore uh, School of Business of the University of Ohio, Carolina, where they're going to focus on culture and finance. So they're going to address, you know, how culture affects financial decisions, which I think uh, it's, it's uh, given, you know, the amount of research that we have so far, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting, you know, area to, to look at it and, and work uh, to the extent that uh, the, right, the right data. So this is our work base today. Right? Uh, you can take these two pictures basically and, and, and uh, never forget what has been documented. There are others that have played with sentiment, right, and try to show that you know sentiment is 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 behind a lot of anomalies, but not this particular one. Right. The kind of surprising one has been sort of you know but uh, many many now uh, are PhD students and some of you guys suspect uh, use invariably you know the final French three-factor model or an augmented version by you know the uh, momentum uh, factor. Uh, this still, in our in our view, does not resolve the problem. It does not give you a cost of equity capital that is appropriate to use at all times. What I'm saying here is that your cost of equity capital that you are interested in making, you know, because it says, you know, the value of this company, right, has to be sort of estimated over a short-term period, relatively short-term period. And this also comes from a lot of practitioners who used to tell us, you know, in academia that uh, the maximum uh, 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 amount of data that it should be used should be about, you know, three years to five years. Which is, if you look back to the, you know, what has happened to the markets, there are, the cycles in, in finance are about, you know, five to seven years, basically. All right. Now, another thing that makes this case uh, very important here, uh, and uh, you can, I'm not trying to sell this, but I'm pretty sure at the end uh, you'll be convinced is that uh, the demographics in the marketplace do not stay static. Right. What do I mean by this? There are investors and investors. Older investors retire, take the money, go to Napier or Bahamas, right? And younger investors are busy betting for what? the outcome of the law. And the younger generation of investors basically do not have the experience of the older generation. They don't know fundamentals. They don't, they have not experienced the recession. I'm talking about newly born. And to the extent that the demographics change, and this is something universal, it's not just, you know, something that we observe in the States, and I'll give you a good example. Uh, it happens everywhere. And that's why we believe that you know, educating investors is of paramount importance for societies to live with you know, correct values, asset values, to the extent that it's possible. And as educators, right, we have a responsibility to do that. Now, let me uh, go back to the demographics, right? Now, we talk about culture, now we talk about dem demographics. Demographics are extremely important, right? I had different experience as a youngster than you did. I had one pair of shoes, you probably would have 15. Right? And so on and so forth. Now, in 89, 1989, we have a major collapse in the US capital market, right? Remember the long term capital management run by two Nobel Prize winners, plus numerous smart, very smart finance guys. Today in the West, you know, schools in the, in, the, in the States. Now, there have been a number of studies showing that around that time, around that time, when we had this first crisis, 87 and uh, 97, basically, there's a huge exodus of senior investment players from the markets, mostly investment bankers. And remember back then, before investment banking was merged with the banking sector, 
The investment bankers had seen the game. They, had, they, they were really liability companies. They could not take a lot of risk. But these guys had bad experiences. They lived through the Second World War. They lived the 50s and the 60s, where the US market was very stagnant. And they were very risk averse. Therefore, their migrations were more reasonable, more close to fundamentals than the decade prior to the crash, the major crash, the tech crash, the bubble uh, tech crash in 2000-2001. As I said, there are some studies, some interesting studies that address these issues. So it's cultural and demographics that uh, play a role. Uh, in why we don't address these issues here in this paper, I think they merit, they merit, they want an investigation in my view. So, um, I'm not going to spend more time on this, but uh, essentially what I'm going to say is that, you know, sentiment in essence, and uh, you can, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, induces bias in, in human beliefs, right? And, and to the extent that this, this is happening, this gets reflected into, you know, um, asset, asset prices. Uh, more specifically, you know, optimistic investors tend to expect, you know, better results, and they keep on betting, and, and, and uh, sh you know, lead prices to higher and higher valuations, and at the end of the day, right, higher valuations result in what? Lower returns. Uh, you can look at the mergers and acquisitions literature, right? I mean, if you look at the conventional kind of analysis, what you see is that, you know, companies, bidders, right, realize what? Negative abnormal returns, right? A good, uh, one explanation, not the only one, one explanation for that kind of result is basically that bidders are sitting on a lot of free cash flow, right, excess money, right, or access to cheap money, the, and, 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 and trying to sort of, you know, protect the high valuations, they keep on engaging into buying assets, mostly unrelated assets, that essentially, you know, have a, a poor, you know, a synergy result, and eventually lead to a, a very poor performance, all right? Or the managers, my, someone could argue in line with what we say here, could be what? Extremely overconfident. Uh, what is an overconfident guy? An overconfident guy is basically someone who believes that he's better than the average, right? He believes that he has the skills to perform multiple tasks in complicated, you know, areas, and um, that essentially, this um, is, you know, severe risk price. Okay. So, um, as we said before, limits of arbitrage and, and, and borrowing limits, right, allow these guys to sort of, you know, uh, uh, do all kinds of things in the marketplace and um, uh, obtain the uh, first result, uh, the first diagram that, that you saw earlier. Here I'm just giving you, you know, some other I've already mentioned that some other, you know, studies basically uh, that have tried to, you know, address, you know, uh, the size effect, the momentum effect, uh, and, and several other anomalies, right? Um, but uh, if you read all these studies, right, what comes out of this literature is that um, I know, I mean, uh, 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 anomalies are, you know, are not just statistically, but economically associated with, you know, high sentiment. So anomalies happen. And when we refer to anomalies, we, talk, we refer to mispricing, right? Drifting prices away from fundamentals. So uh, we take this and essentially, right, uh, we say that, you know, in optimistic times, right, you're going to have a sort of an in, in, invalidation of the capital asset pricing model, while in pessimistic times, investors will be more reasonable, less optimistic, right? And um, values would be close to, uh, you know, uh, trade close to increasing, uh, you know, uh, fundamentals or values. Uh, and in essence, this is this is our our story, right? So uh, here I'm repeating, you know, uh, what I just said, and I, I show you, you know, two types of regressions, right? Um, the first regression basically is this one, right? Where assets, asset prices, are basically you know a function of fundamentals. And this is what the neoclassical theory, you know, uh, teaches us. Says that basically, 
investors don't have an incentive, right, to drift away from fundamentals. Uh, investors are, you know, very rational. Uh, they have perfect foresight, uh, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and limits of arbitrage are not existent, so the prices are basically reflecting true value. We say that that's not true, right? Prices are driven by fundamentals plus noise. And in the context of this analysis, right, uh, who's creating noise? Noise traders, non-sophisticated investors, right? Uh, younger investors, investors with less experience, or investors who um, basically uh, heard uh, about the stock market in the news at night, uh, saying that the Athenian Stock Exchange Index jump by 20%, next day they go to buy, buy the index or buy, you know, any company. All right. Yeah. Can we view those unsophisticated investors or uh, investors from foreign countries as well? Yes. As a matter of fact, the U.S., uh, yeah, about the data, right? The U.S. market has, uh, has its own, uh, not, not only the U.S. market, but also the Athenian Stock Exchange, right? It's dominated not only by, you know, U.S. investors, but also investors from all over the world. It's a global market. And we, we use the U.S. You know, as an index, right, as a proxy of the global market, right? We use it, the U.S. index as a global. But look at the Athenian Stock Exchange, right? What, what percentage of uh, you know, uh, trade here is local, right? The bulk of trading is basically what? Institutionally driven. Mm -hmm. When institutions leave, and, and these institutions are foreign, right? So even the other stock exchange is a global market, right? And it could be moved by mood outside of the U.S. Right? Outside of the Greece, I'm sorry. Right? So, uh, with the world basically, you know, uh, reaching greater convergence and integration, right? Kakata, uh, uh, this is reality. Uh, you're going to observe more or less the same. We don't have doubts. More or less the same angle results. But we have no doubts. Um, So uh, we have a theoretical model. Basically, we extend this Daniel and Toll model, right? Uh, and, and in a sense, I have it here, but um, uh, the computer is a bit slow. I, I'll show you. Okay. Um, we have a sort of a, a very simple model, which is an extension of, you know, uh, Daniel and Toll uh, paper. And uh, in a sense, uh, we make, you know, two empirical predictions, right? Uh, and these empirical predictions are uh, here, right? Uh, in the bi by regression, fundamental price ratios, right, uh, are positively uh, related or predict uh, returns, all right? And uh, the other one is that in a multiple game, uh, you know, uh, 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 regression, we should sort of, you know, observe uh, uh, a, a similar kind of, of relationship. And our second, you know, uh, proposition or conjecture coming out of this very simple model, which been sort of, you know, uh, adjusted to uh, yield this kind of uh, predictions, it shows that in pessimistic times, right, the standard car pan is more likely to be held, which is what we saw in the right-hand side graph of, uh, of, of, the, of the, uh, the slides before. All right. Um, now, uh, this is uh, sort of a glimpse of uh, you know, um, uh, the data. As I said, uh, the key here uh, metric is the uh, confidence index, all right, or the sentiment index. Uh, we use the Bayer Wobbler, and uh, basically this index is, is available on, uh, on Wobbler's you know, website. He's at NYU, uh, and uh, you can have access. It's free, right? Um, and uh, this is uh, available from 65 to 2000. They keep on updating, but when we started working on this, um, we start, you know, in 2010. And, um, and, and we use this sample period of 66 to 2010, basically. Uh, the uh, Consumer Confidence Index has a different time period. Uh, and the fact that we find, you know, similar results, that tells us that, you know, the time frame doesn't really, you know, uh, uh, influence uh, the results. Uh, we use a standard methodology here, right? Uh, Pharma French, Pharma Macbeth, right? Kind of analysis. And um, 
since, uh, and we find more or less the same results. Since uh, our uh, key variable here, right, in every study you have a key variable, right, key metric. Um, uh, we want to see basically, we want to see uh, essentially how, you know, uh, uh, the sentiment, right, uh, index works. As you can see, right, this figure is a bit small, the sentiment index uh, captures pretty much basically, you know, the ups and downs in the marketplace. In a very nice way. And as I said, uh, this is the basic index. We are not using the basic index. We go one step further to orthogonalize this to a number of macroeconomic variables to make sure that the index doesn't capture, you know, that stuff. Something that, you know, previous researchers have criticized Becky Wobler and uh, criticized us, uh, and uh, we want to sort of, you know, be immune to this kind of uh, criticism, all right? So uh, the bigger popular in an actual, right, shows you that Cornwood with one lack, right, with what's going on in the marketplace. And it's been widely used all over the place. I have two PhD students in China that actually are developing the Chinese work, bigger popular kind of index, believe it or not. Uh, and uh, the results are somewhat different. And uh, I would suspect that the difference is it has to do with culture and the betting attitude of a lot of investors in China and the historical development of China. Uh, it's different in what sense? It's much more pronounced. If you look at the real estate market in China, right, some prices are skyrocketing. Skyrocketing. Uh, what's going to happen? We'll find out that uh, a lot of financial institutions have overextended themselves, and uh, uh, that could be a sort of a, 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 a problem. Now, uh, we use pre you know, formation, right, uh, uh, data to form our portfolios, right, one ten portfolios, pretty standard, right? And here we sort of, you know, show you the post formation, you know, betas. Uh, what you can see here is that low beta stacks, Right? Uh, or uh, how about betas, right? Cut when I say. Look at uh, the portfolios that contain you know, high betas, right? When you put them together, right, um, this is what you end up with. There's a big difference here, right? Between low and high beta. And the other interesting thing that you can see here is that, you know, as the size of an asset, right, or a portfolio, or a stack, right, is, is increasing, right? What happens to uh, uh, the, this is the natural law of, uh, uh, of size, right? What happens to the beta? The beta goes down. So basically, small companies, right, are essentially high beta stocks. Small companies are high beta stocks, risky stocks. Why? Because we have limited information. There are a few security analysts that dig information out and disseminate it, right? And um, it's very difficult to find it. So you, security analysts in any market, right, they specialize on a few uh, segments or a segment of the market. And actually, sell side analysts, right, concentrate on what? On assets or stocks that can generate what? Money not only to themselves, but also to the businesses that they work for, the brokers, the brokerage houses. I mean, security guys work for brokerage houses, right? So they track and follow these stocks. What about the other stuff? They're not followed. So basically, if you jump into other stocks, smaller stocks that are not, you know, followed by security guys or mutual funds or sophisticated investors, right, the chances are that you're going to be getting what? High returns, right? And, and we are realizing that you're taking what? The high risk, right? So it's like a sort of a beauty contest, basically, right? You go for beauty, right? Then uh, you lose in terms of substance. So the, the post formation data, basically, the portfolios here work pretty nice as you would expect. So that makes you comfortable, right? That, that this is not coming out of massaging or uh, the data or creating portfolios, right? Um, the way you would like them to sort of, you know, 
uh, be reported. Okay. So um, the next table here uh, is just to show you uh, to confirm what uh, we just said uh, about you know size and 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 and, and book to market. Now the book to market, right, uh, is known as what the the value premium, right? And the, the natural log ME is the size, right? Now look at uh, the value. Who are the value companies? The value companies are essentially these 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 high bets that that you're expecting to sort of you know come up a winner, right? Uh, you pay a tiny uh, amount of money, like you know, uh, you buy a scratch. And you expect to win twenty thousand, right? With a dot, with a euro, right? So uh, they should be holding a lot of a lot of risk there, right? Um, so look at this, uh, the first line here. All right, what do you see here? The high beta stocks, right? Right, or the high beta portfolios, right? Have what? have a different pattern, right, than the size pattern. Look at the uh, uh, low beta, right? The low beta stocks are, if I read it well, 4.84 in the high beta small cap stocks, have, or larger stocks, right, have a, have a, have a, have a lower beta. Right. If you look at the returns, right, the, uh, Performance, right? The performance also is different. And it's not just even statistically different too, right? If you look at volatility and security analysts, you know, dimension of our analysis, which captures the element uh, I just highlighted before about, you know, uh, how individual investors are able to sort of, you know, uh, uh, figure out increasing value or, or properly ask uh, 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 price, you know, uh, uh, securities, uh, you see the same kind of fund, there's a big difference here, right? Low security analysts, right? Uh, uh, stocks have high beta, right? Uh, and high beta basically, uh, essentially, is, is awarded uh, low returns down the road because you chase them, you pay high prices to, to acquire them and put them into your portfolio, all right? So um, uh, here uh, we, we do some sort of, you know, uh, simple, you know, uh, rolling beta, uh, full sample beta kind of analysis, just to see whether our analysis conforms with the previous, you know, uh, analysis from my French and other uh, researchers. And what you can see here, if you look at the, the mean, right, of returns, whether you, look, you use that, uh, you know, rolling betas, right, over time versus, you know, full sample, you know, betas, the betas are essentially, right, uh, more or less the same. So. There's no, there's no, there's no, you know, our, our results basically, our analysis very consistent with previous uh, literature, right? Uh, and this is a sort of a, a, a key result basically that reflects uh, what we saw in our uh, original uh, sneak preview graph. If you look at the overall, right, line here, right, you look at betas. Right, low beta stocks, high beta stocks, right? Uh, the the difference, right, is very small. Here you use all the data. You allow pessimistic and optimistic investors to participate, right? And you don't consider you don't consider splitting, you know, the market into two uh, according to the behavior of investors. Right? So you get this flat line. The security market market line is flat. So top end doesn't hold. So this result validates the previous evidence provided by Pharma French in 1992. All right? We find the same result. Now, uh, when you look at pessimistic periods, right, you see what? There's a big difference, right? right? High beta stocks, low beta stocks. Look at the difference, right? The relationship, the security market line is positive, like we saw before. All right? But in optimistic times, it's essentially what? Flat. So this result on the first line, it's essentially driven by what? Optimistic investors participating in the marketplace. And that has an interesting implication, right? As, as I mentioned before, and I, I, I like to repeat it here, uh, saying that 
It doesn't make any sense to estimate the cost of every capital, no matter what kind of asset pricing model you use. You can use this one, or you can use the formal French three-factor, or the momentum, you know, uh, four-factor model. But you have to be very sensitive to the fact that the market might be sentimental, right? Or might be what? More subtle, more pessimistic, all right? Would you buy a house now, or with the tendency that you would have you know, 10 years ago? No way. You are thinking twice. Why? Liquidity constraints. Boring, right? It's limited. Right? Arbitrage is limited. And you think exports, prices, were very high. Therefore, you might anticipate that prices might go a bit lower. Therefore, that holds you back in we are essentially inactive, allowing prices to settle and um, get close to the fundamental values. All right? So, unconditionally, the capital asset pricing model, and that's the message of the paper, it doesn't work. Condition on optimistic or pessimistic, right? Or pessimistic to be better, right? Is it's holding, and that's what uh, you know. Uh, our results show. Uh, here we do some additional, you know, things to show you that you know momentum and uh, book to market or value uh, characteristics do not alter our results. We still find the same value, right? We split, you know, the sample as before for the whole sample, and then pessimistic, optimistic periods. In as you can see from uh, the uh, these two. Tables here, it's, it's the same result. All right. I, I don't know how much time we have, but, uh, but I'm going to do this, right, and show you uh, essentially um, uh, these uh, three sets of regressions. This regression is for the whole video, right? And, and here um, we account for, we have a fully grown you know, model, right? Here, this one. For the whole period, basically, you look at the this is basically, right? The security market line is flat, right? What you see here is size is a big factor, right? The higher the size of the company, the less risky. The less risky, the lower rate of return you ask as an investor, right? Book to market, right? The value, right? The value, right? The higher the, uh, the valuation of the stock, right? The less likely to realize higher returns. Now, here you can see that we have returned for one month. And here you can see that there is a, it's, there's a short term reversal, which says that you know, asset prices go up, but then they come back you know, to uh, 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 restore value in a, in, a, in a short period of time, which is interesting. And, and very, very much in line with those that tend to believe that you know, the market has, you know, the, uh, the, the internal mechanisms to self-correct it. But um, this is not what um, we believe is happening here. The other thing that you can see here is that the midterm, right, the medium uh, term momentum, which, you know, Japanese and others have discovered, right, is, is very robust. This momentum. In a whole sample. Now, we did this further and we said, well, let's concentrate on the pessimistic and optimistic tables. Right? Right? Now, we saw before that during optimistic periods, right, the beta, right, it's, it's not price. It's a good really market line, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not positively sloping. It's very, it's, it's flat. Look at this, it's flat. In pessimistic periods, it's not. The capitalized price in the falls during periods where is abundance of rationality, right? Less optimism in the marketplace. Size holds. Size is a risk factor. The smaller the company, the higher the risk. Why? And therefore, you ask for a higher rate of time. Why? Because these companies are very difficult to buy, right? You have to take a lot of this. You don't know who runs these companies, right? Uh, the uh, book to market works. But look at this, the book market works more. The value premium works more during optimistic periods, which is very consistent with our previous right? And this 
is, is a sort of a fully blown kind of analysis that, that shows you uh, uh, in, a, in a more comprehensive way that the role of uh, pessimism or optimism in the marketplace is, is of paramount importance in terms of you know, uh, uh, valuing uh, assets. And as a result of that, you know, estimating uh, uh, the cost of equity capital or, you know, the way that is cost of capital if a company is leveraged, is, is, is subject to leverage, right? So um, I'm repeating the, uh, here a few things that I said before. Um, now we take this, uh, our analysis to sort of, you know, uh, Direction. And what do we do is basically uh, we track you know, uh, capital flows, right? And we focus on mutual fund capital flows. <coughs> now, mutual funds are basically uh, a problem vehicles of investment for individual investors. So when a lot of investors invest in mutual funds, right, basically what do they do? They, they chase, you know, gains, right? Naive investors, right, they want to invest in mutual funds, they buy portfolios, right, or different categories of portfolios. So basically what we say is that one way to proxy for, right, the inability of, or the noise, or the non-sophisticated inability of individual investors is to look at the flows of mutual funds. Uh, Franzini and, 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 and Lamont have done uh, this kind of work and, and they have developed a measure we use the same kind of measure, and as you can see here, right, here we show you only the optimistic and pessimistic periods, the results basically are very consistent. What, what, what I mean by consistent? Consistent in terms of flow, capital flows, right, flow more during optimistic times in speculative, you know, high beta stocks than in pessimistic times. And that's why, you know, mutual fund managers Right? Don't like to receive huge capital flows because they have limited options to invest. And if they get this money, right, what do they do? They keep on buying, they keep on pushing you know, asset prices at a higher level, even though they don't want to. One way to get out of this is basically to create new funds or uh, find, find ways to diffuse you know, these kinds of pressures. So this is a proxy that for noise trading, which shows you that. Noise trading is basically, you know, very costly to a rational investor. Noise traders in the real estate market, in, in the capital market, or any market, right, are basically a cost to society. You don't want noise traders, right? You want educated traders. And that's our message uh, from a sort of a, you know, a sociological kind of point of view, if you wish, all right? Now, we run a robustness check here, you know, uh, doing different uh, additional measures, as I said before, and I'm not going to take, you know, uh, a lot of time. It's already, you know, uh, third, 15 after 3. Um, the results are basically you know, the same for different patterns, for different kinds of uh, measures of uh, uh, riskiness. Uh, difference of opinion, as you can see here in one of our panels, right, uh, when we focus on security analysis, shows you that when there is dispersion of opinion, in the marketplace, right? The guys that trade are the optimistic investors. The guys that are pessimistic are basically sitting on the benchmark, watching the game, right? Do not participate, and ultimately these optimistic investors that pay high prices, they end up doing what? Realizing low returns. The portfolios has, have, the portfolios, uh, have you know, low performance, all right? Because they have push prices, at high levels, all right? So it's not worth it to buy, you know, when everybody's buying, essentially, right? Uh, being contrarian, it's not a bad thing, right? Um, here we use a mission that, right? That's the consumer, you know, confident index. Uh, it's based on a sort, of a, a, a sort of a questionnaire that the University of Michigan is running consistently over the years. And this is not a market based index, right, like the bigger Wobbler is basically, you know, a general index uh, that ordinary people, you know, can sort of, you know, respond to questions that, you know, the Michigan uh, uh, index uh, uh, provides them. Um, as I said before, we orthogonalize this uh, metric as we did with the bigger Wobbler, and if you look at this uh, breakdown here, is that in optimistic times we find basically what? 
the security market line holding in optimistic times is flat. Overall, it's flat. So the overall flatness that was discovered by Farmer French is due to the participation of noise traders, excessive you know, optimism in the marketplace. All right? Conclusions. All right? Uh, beta is positively linked, right, during optimi pessimistic times, right? Um, the relationship breaks down during optimistic times. Our results hold, uh, you know, um, for portfolio and regression, you know, uh, uh, frameworks, all right? Uh, and they're not even buying any sort of uh, 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 the choice of an index. Uh, these are the indices that uh, uh, we had and are available. In the end, uh, these are uh, the results, basically. All right? The contributions of the paper already discussed, and I don't want to repeat that, right, is that um, time variation, right, is, is evident. The beta, it's not a study. It varies with time. And it varies because the nature of market participants is changing, or the expectations of market participants is changing. When optimistic investors dominate the market, right, then you have a breakdown. In using the capital asset pricing model or a similar model to estimate the cost of equity capital, it's bad business. You're going to end up basically overestimating the value of the capital of an asset, overestimating the value of the company. All right. So uh, this is the reason why we give two exams to our students, right? A midterm and a final. A midterm might do extremely well, and then the final crash, or the other way around. All right. So uh, for a corporate finance point, of, I mean. So the market is dominated basically by sentiment without any doubt, and I'm a firm believer, and I'm pretty sure you will too. Corporate finance, the estimation of the cost, cost of equity capital, uh, sort of a, a, a key metric for our work, right? Uh, whether you use the capital asset pricing uh, model or any other model, right, to estimate the net present value of an asset, uh, you have to sort of you know, be sensitive to you know, the period. And the policy implication, as I said before, it's our paramount duty as educators, right, to educate people wherever we go and, and, and tell them that not to be overly excited by just listening, listening to a security analyst, particularly a sell side analyst, or, or an executive, right, uh, who's trying to sell, you know, uh, an asset on a roadshow. You have to, you know, hold a small basket, right, so that not all eggs get break at the end of the day. And uh, that's briefly you know, uh, my message, right? Or our message. Thank you very much. As I said, both the slides and the paper are here on the desktop, so you know. Ωραία, ήταν ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον paper. Προφανώ θα πάρουμε ερωτήσει. Σε πολλαπλά επίπεδα και, στην, και, και στο θέμα της, των ανομαλιών από τον ορθολογισμό, που είναι αυτό που ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ τι αγορέ, αυτό που ζήσαμε και με τον long term capital. Πάντα αυτό ήταν μεγάλο σοκ. Είχε γίνει και best seller το βιβλίο τότε στην Αμερική. Ήταν, ήταν 20 traders ομολόγων από τι Alamo Brothers. 20 διδακτορικά ήταν. Ναι, Uh, the local capital management uh, actually uh, they were arbitrage lawyers. That's what they were doing. They were sort of you know, looking at two assets, two similar assets, essentially, drifting from the law of one price, right? These two guys should be trading at the same price. But when these trades at a high price, right? What do you do? What do you do? Pull it up. Pull it up. You short this guy, you go long on this one, basically. Now, to the extent that long-term capital management guys were doing that consistently, right, they were making tons of money. In capital markets, who were giving them tons of money to invest. And they were not asking questions. If they asked questions with regards to where their money was invested, long-term capital management would tell them, that's none of your business, right? Give us your money. And they were giving the money. Now, when they started, basically, to gamble, place bets on seemingly similar assets, 
that got no closed substitutes, that's risky. I'll give you an example. When you start getting traded on the overpricing of rational, you know, 10 year bonds, what is the substitute? How are you going to get your position? As an average reserve, right, you have limited capital, and you want to take positions, but again, you want to hedge a good fraction. How are you going to find a substitute of the rational government bond for 10 years maturity, right? Because it doesn't make sense. So you take a big combo. They were assuming, right, that this is not going to happen. And things happen. Hmm. The bottom line in Amazon, you know, Είχαν πάρει εκατό φορέ τα λεφτά του. Ένα δισεκατομμύριο και πήγαν εκατό δισεκατομμύρια του έδωσαν. Τράβε λόγω ακριβώ των δύο νομπελίστων. Λοιπόν, νομίζω. Νομπελίστων, με ήταν, με γιώτα, δεν έχει σημασία. Με γιώτα, το ξέρω, αλλά λέω. Νόμπελ, πράγμα. Λοιπόν, εντάξει, αστείο. Νομίζω ότι είναι πολύ ενδιαφέροντα όλα αυτά και με το θέμα των φλόγων στο capital. Στα βιβλία κεφάλαια είναι πάρα πολύ σοβαρό που αυτό είναι και σημάδι. Ανομαλίας. Γι' αυτό και το Fidelity ο Μαγελάνος δύο φορές είχε κλείσει. Είναι, αυτά είναι πολύ ενδιαφέροντα όλα. Ε, θα προχωρήσω σε ερωτήσεις. Δημήτρη Θεσκάτη. And the efficient market of hypothesis, and you say yes, the markets are efficient, but they are mainly efficient during the pessimistic period. And that's exactly what this study says. The market is more efficient during pessimistic times because, because investors are more rational. Mm -hmm. They're not crazy. They try, you know, they're, they're, there is a, there is a uh, you know, uh, a speed limit, right? Are you a There is a speed limit. He does not. Όπω σα είπα προηγουμένω, το Χαλί βρίσκεται α πούμε under view in a very rapid zone. This is the second round actually, we hope to make it. But this is a very provocative thing. Right? And you know, provocative things are subject to a lot of friction for whatever reason. And I'm not going to extend the comment on this. But this is the essence here. If you have a speed limit, right? 60 or 90 or whatever, right? If you go 140, right? Crash is going to happen. And, and this is the same thing in, in capital markets. There is efficiency, but it's limited and time based. Now, one of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reviewers and also, you know, uh, uh, esteemed colleague and discussant on, on uh, presentations like this, it says that. Uh, this is not, you know, uh, sort of a momentum, momentum story, right? Uh, it could be, it could be basically a time varying beta story, or uh, the market is efficient at certain times, inefficient others. But and we don't dispute that. We say yes. But what is the reason for the market to be efficient or inefficient at times, right? When you drive your car with, uh, and, and you saw, and, uh, can, can be able to come in for your tahiliros, let's see. Uh, it's a car, it's a animal, and it's a matician. It's been a profit, it's a serious. But then, almost, why is it a radiophone and a basic device? It's a traditional thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a good thing. It's a good thing that is a can start driving like crazy, right? And these things happen in the market too. But if I'm managers that do the same things, they, they are subject to overconfidence. I don't know, let's, can we talk about managers? They think that they, uh, they run the earth. The, yeah. Because they, I mean, they're just human beings. I'm not saying that they are not, they're not an manager. Uh, they have a lot of experience, right? They, 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 they have done a lot of things, good things, but also bad things, but you know, it's very difficult to tell them something. They, they have advisors, right? Do you think they listen to all the advisors? No, all the advisors. Right? And I think that you have to be open. In my view, these guys have to be open. You know, in executive training programs, right, when we get uh, executives, you know, uh, from that industry, this is what we try to tell them. You know, they come to the programs and they say, well, we know that, we know that, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. Uh, why then do you hear? 
And the only thing that you can teach them basically is to be more rational. All right, and show them what happens in other subjects, right, and do the rational. Yes, sir. It's a great pleasure to have Janis with us. And that was a very interesting presentation. Very substantial, I would say, because this is a very strong result from Kappen using pessimistic period, yeah. Uh, I just also drawing from practical experience. What you mentioned, uh, that is from my previous post. Uh, yes. What you mentioned in uh, optimistic periods that you actually, the campaign does not work, and you have all this market inefficiency and irrational behavior. <coughs> if we take into account that uh, in the market you have not only what you call small investors, but you have institutional investors <coughs> who take their decision based on analysis. So in respect of the market is in a pessimistic or optimistic side, they try to make the rational decision, or they, they should, I don't know, you analyze that. <coughs> what I'm thinking is, and judging from uh, experience that I had, is it possible that during the optimistic period, where liquidity tends to rise more than in the pessimistic period, yes. Is it possible that you have an inflow, an influx? And that's exactly what we show. Of, yeah, the of, inflows of, of, of new investors, of investors who are noise traders, who are volume. Not, we use volume uh, as just, a proxy. Yes, I'm just trying to segregate the, yes. the investors. Uh, so, is it possible that you may have investors who actually enter the market in rising periods and they avoid the market in pessimistic periods? so that they also contribute to this same right. yeah. That's a good point, that, that's an excellent point. Basically, right. that relates to the demographics issue, right? If you're newcomers, if you have newcomers into the market, uh, we, we tend to believe that, you know, the investors, noisy investors, <laughs> which, which <laughs> is very, right, <coughs> uh, the problem you have, right, and I wish uh, we can address this, and uh, you know, this is something that I didn't address, guys, is that uh, it's, it's, it's an issue of data. We don't have this yes, kind of data. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. Uh, Mel Mel Medir and Tate, uh, there is a classic paper by uh, Mel Medir and Tate, uh, where they show uh, <coughs> basically uh, how managerial decisions at the corporate level are affected by past experience. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you have good past experience, right, it's less likely that you're going to engage into bad decisions. How do they engage in uh, past experience? They look at the age of corporate managers. They have a roster, they figure out the age, right? Uh, they were sort of you know, 15 years old, right? Or 16 years old when, uh, in 1960. So you know that these guys have lived you know, some past experiences, right? And, and they look at this kind of data, very unique data. That's what I'm saying that, you know, finding unique data, it's, 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 it's a paramount importance. And you don't have to subscribe to a sort of a theory or, or a story uh, you don't have to get married to the story, you get married to the data, basically. And whatever the data, the, the, the data tells you, uh, basically that's, that's, that's the result of, of scientific work. Because you're not, you're not trying to push your line. Uh, we have people that want to push your line, basically, but fewer than ever before, because of the availability of data. Even pharma, right, a great theoretician, right, 99% of his work is, is uh, it's, it's a big. And Fama has commented on this, uh, and, and, and he, tends to, he, he claims basically that this is not inconsistent with rational, rationality. We don't say that it's inconsistent. What we say is that at periods when there is excessive irrationality, you get boobies like this. You get a crash. I mean, it's a very simple story, basically. Right? Um, but, uh, you know, if you put uh, in the marketplace to come up with this flow, it's difficult. That uh, what you can do is on a proprietary basis, if someone knows, let's say, you know, a couple of fund managers, uh, they can give you that, you know, that. that, that the uh, investor participation, but in, in aggregate, not in right. the case that we need. Uh, yeah, the, the disadvantage of this is that when you sit down and you walk and write a paper and spend you know, a couple of years, you know what the referees are going to say? Well, this is kind of data. 
ή μια κορυφή που μιλάει με ένα δίκτυο. Και γι' αυτό και από όσο και εμπειρία δεν ασχολούνται γιατί είναι χαμένο χρόνο. Αλλά εάν έχετε πρόβλημα σε τέτοιου είδου στατιστικά στοιχεία, εγώ ασχολούμαι με ένα. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ. Ε...